to the cutting edge with Dr. Lee Pearson and Dr. Robert Stubblefield. I'm Steve Richens, and back on our show today, a reoccurring guest, James uh, Elias. He has another controversial idea, and it's it's regarding induction, and the title is Inductive Narrative Systematization, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Lee for some opening comments. All right, I'm not going to say too much here because we'll, we'll get James going. And then uh, I, my thought was to do something like we did last week, which had James talk. And then I would uh, we should have our resident expert in hierarchy, Dr. Stubblefield, have the first crack at him. And then we'll just have a discussion after that. Uh, I, but let me see if I can bring up something that, that to, uh, motivate James in a, in, some, in a particular direction. You know, induction has been written and thought about for how long, James? 2,500 years? I mean, at least since Aristotle, maybe Socrates? At least, yeah. You know, uh, maybe other guys before then, who knows? And then there, it goes through Bacon, and then uh, there's Galileo, and there's Huell, and there's David Hume, and there's Karl Popper. You know, these are anti-inductivists. And uh, and uh, Harriman and Peikoff, and who knows? Who, I mean, there, there are lots of this. Oh, the, my favorite guys, among my favorites, are uh, Joseph, who wrote about induction in his book on logic at the same time as the, uh, he, from Oxford at the same time as the Cambridge guys were going the other direction towards probability. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff. So I guess generally, uh, one problem I have when I'm uh, uh, reading stuff in this field is, when I read it, I want to know, I want to try to figure out what's new, what's different. What do I not, what do I learn? What do I not know? Because one thing I think I already know how to do inductive reasoning pretty well. I, I'm not, I don't say I'm perfect, but I, I know kind of a fair amount about it. So I want to know, you know, as they said in the old uh, Wendy's ad, where's the beef? The part that's actually uh, new and different from what's already out there. And that's kind of hard to, given the history, the huge history. I'll stop there and turn it over to you, James. Well, I'll be sure to emphasize that uh, today then, because that is a good thing to, to emphasize. So um, today, what I want to introduce the audience to, actually, let me ask you guys, all three of you, have you watched um, the video? Uh, have you watched my first lecture of the inductive summary of physics? I watched it. Okay, cool. Okay, but let me confess that I decided I wanted to, um, well, this is an excuse for not, for not doing my homework. Uh, I decided I wanted to look at it uh, from the standpoint of somebody in the audience. Because, you know, we, okay. whoever's listening, they may or may, some of them may have seen your videos, some not. And I'm, you know, from the standpoint of, an, I want to look at it from the innocent eye of an ignorant person. At least that was my excuse. <laughs> That's a very so good I'll, excuse, I'll, Lee, for not doing your homework. That's excellent. It I'll, saved you. It saved you a full two hours of time. So no, and, I and do it, it actually has a good end. So I will eventually do it. Uh, of course, it won't be two hours because yeah. I'm going to watch it at two x, like I watch everything at two x. Okay. But uh, but I'm not going to do that yet. So go go anyway. Go ahead. If you do that with Ben Shapiro, does your head explode? Because <laughs> that's like a six x. Anyway, okay. So here's the deal. Um, so um, I have a 17 lecture series and hopefully when, and, and soon it will be 20 lectures. I have 17 lecture series, which induct, goes through the inductive proof of basic principles of physics. It starts with the ancient Greeks. And at this point, it's gotten all the way to the discovery of the atomic nucleus. And this whole lecture series goes by, uh, it, it uh, uses a certain method I've developed, which I call inductive narrative systematization. And so even if you haven't watched the lectures, then you'll be able to follow this whole conversation because I'm going to give a, um, a quick overview of the method of inductive narrative systematization right now for Lee and everyone else who hasn't seen the lectures. So here's the deal. Here is the question that my method of inductive narrative systematization answers. The question is, 
how can we lay out observations and reasoning steps in such a way as to allow someone to know that a conclusion follows from certain observations? If we had a systematic way of doing this, it would allow science, it would allow a scientist to lay out his reasoning and see for himself with certainty that his conclusions were correct. Then by laying it out in this particular method, which I'm about to tell you, he would be able to communicate that knowledge in a form which was inductively certain to others. In other words, the proof, the inductive proof can be objectively communicated. So now there's a major obstacle to this. So that, so in short, to answer Lee's question, that's what, that's the new thing I'm offering today is a method of laying out your proof and a method of objectively communicating an inductive proof. Now there's a major obstacle to achieving this, which is that induction doesn't just reason from observation. It also reasons from prior knowledge. And here's why this is such a huge obstacle. In many sciences, especially physics, modern practitioners are standing on top of this enormous skyscraper of prior knowledge. Uh, and a lot of that prior knowledge is stuff that they've been taught, but they don't actually know the proof of. They don't actually understand the observations and reasoning steps that, that prove them. So as a result, many of the floors of this tower that they're standing on, especially quantum mechanics and relativity, are flawed and corrupt all of the floors above them. And as a result, um, and, and because uh, these ideas are passed down in term, not in terms of proof, but just in terms of say so, basically, these ideas are held as floating abstractions a lot of times. So here's an example of why this ends up being a problem. In modern physics, there's a particular quantum phenomena called entanglement. And this phenomena involves a faster than light causal interaction. Um, however, most modern physicists don't accept this because it contradicts Einstein's theory of general relativity and special relativity. But if you were to, so if you were to ask such a physicist how he knows that special relativity is true. So I, I, I came into this situation when I was getting my master's degree, in fact, and when I was presenting my master, when I was defending my master's thesis, I stated that this was a fast and light causal interaction. And they said, well, wait, that contradicts relativity. And I said, well, how do you know relativity is true? And they just scoffed at me. It was not considered important to actually understand the observations and reasoning steps for yourself that allowed you to accept prior, this prior knowledge to accept Einstein's theory. They were basically resorting to consensus. So the solution to this problem, the problem of prior knowledge, how do you know your prior knowledge is true? The solution to this problem that I'm offering today is that we record the observations and reasoning steps which could have proven the conclusions in a possible order of discovery. So at any stage, the reasoning steps in a inductive proof must only use ideas which were themselves proven earlier in that same work, in that same book or lecture. Now, if science were actually passed down in this form in terms of its proof, then these modern physicists, my uh, professors who were um, attacking my, what do you call the people who you're defending against? The attackers, the people, my, my committee, this, these physicists who are on my committee, um, we could have had an actual conversation about this instead of them resorting to consensus. They could have given the observations and reasoning steps uh, by which uh, Einstein arrived at his conclusions. And then we could have an actual scientific discussion about whether those conclusions were arrived at validly. But because we don't have a way of doing this, because it's generally not understood how to systematize our knowledge in terms of its inductive proof, these physicists basically just resorted to an argument from authority and consensus. Now, what I propose uh, to achieve this, to actually sh uh, systematize our knowledge in terms of its proof, is that proof should be presented as a fictional, fictional narrative, which documents observations and reasoning steps, which inductively prove a conclusion.
And then this fictional narrative should proceed in a possible order of discovery. So for example, you could tell a story of how someone first made the discoveries of Galileo, then used that knowledge to make new observations and then discover Kepler's principles, then use that knowledge to arrive at Newton's principles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and such a narrative, such a fiction would roughly follow historical order, but we would alter it. You would alter the narrative in order to number one, follow rigorous inductive standards and um, to make the discovery process as easy as possible because history doesn't proceed in a very efficient order. So, if, so this is why we want to present a work of fiction, but it needs to be a work of fiction that presents actual observations that one would in fact observe if you were to go out and look at the night sky, if you were to mix certain chemicals together, et cetera. It has to be real observations just presented in a fictional order. Um, and this is what my lecture series, The Inductive Summary of Physics does. It follows this standard to some extent, although it's not yet a rigorous conclusion, but this is a first try at applying this method. Um, now, this method, it's actually really hard to reformat history in this fashion, to reconstruct it so that it's an actual proof. Uh, so I have um, a tool to help keep us on track, to keep us, to make sure that at each stage of the story, the characters are only reasoning from prior knowledge, which has been established earlier in the story. And the way we do this is, is that each integration goes in four phases. And these phases are motivation, investigation, uh, oops, motivation, question, investigation, conclusion. Um, and you can think of this as a replacement for the scientific method that you learned in high school or junior high. And that's motivation, question, investigation, conclusion. You can see it's similar to the scientific method. Um, so let me go through those four phases. So the first one is motivation. Um, in this part of the story, you state the, con the prior context of knowledge and prior context of values, which justify uh, the question and investigation. And the reason you have to do this is that there's an infinite number of things that uh, a scientist can focus his mind on. So the place that you actually direct your attention has to be justified. In other words, reasoning steps have to be justified, but observations have to be justified too. You have to justify why it is you're pointing your eyeballs in a particular direction, maybe towards the sky or into a beaker, whatever it is that observation, you need to give the reason in terms of the prior context of knowledge for why certain observations are important. Um, so here's an example. Um, there's this cool experiment called the cathode, uh, Thompson's cathode ray tube experiment. And this is where um, Thompson basically, he has two charged plates and there's a positive plate, which is so incredibly positive that it actually tears electrons off of the other plate. And as a result, this actually allowed Thompson to observe electrons. Now, in a story like this, you couldn't just present this experiment. You'd have to give the prior context of knowledge for why someone would even think this would work. So for example, who, like, why is it that we even expect there to be little charged particles that can be ripped off of matter? And there is prior evidence of this. The thing that came before was, is that there was evidence that during a chemical reaction, atoms were exchanging charged particles. Also, there was evidence in the fact that um, objects are, uh, uh, that electricity can flow through metals as well. So the prior context of knowledge actually justifies doing a particular experiment. Otherwise, the narrative doesn't have coherence and you're not really, and, and as a result, the context of knowledge is not continuous. The other reason we have to give motivation for an investigation is because uh, what this does is it set, if, if you set up the reason, if you make clear 
why you're investigating a certain topic, then that is critical information for understanding why, uh, why certain conclusions are conceptualized in the way that they are. So for example, in physics, there's two different ways of quantifying motion. I mean, actually there's many, but I'll give you two of them. Momentum and kinetic energy. The, the momentum is mass times velocity and then kinetic energy is mass times velocity squared. So like why square velocity? Like why do we have two different ways of quantifying two, motion? Right? And the reason it, yeah. Over two. Over two, yeah, I didn't want to, yeah, just, yeah, one half mv squared. Yeah, just to be pedantic, sorry. Yeah, yeah, right, for the sake of pedantry. Very good. So <laughs> so why do we have these sorry, two different, I mean, and where, so you could, I mean, you Go could ahead. even ask this, where did the one half come from? Like, okay, yeah, good one question. half mv squared, yeah, right, good yeah, and, and so we don't, like, why, why not, good why question. not one third m squared <laughs> v squared? Why not any other damn thing involving the mass and velocity? We can kind of see how, you know, and the reason is this, in the, over the course of a collision, and collisions happen a lot between different, like that's just when one object bumps into another object. There's uh, like almost uh, like many physical react uh, interactions are collisions between bodies. M times V stays the same over the course of any collision. And then, okay, so why, now why keep track of one half MV squared? The reason for that is, is that that is a particular amount of motion, which is caused by work. And work is a way of tracking motion through a machine, uh, through, uh, tracking motion through a series of belts and gears and pulleys and things like that. So for example, the amount of work you put into the gears of a bicycle is equal to the amount of work that the wheels uh, put out when scraping against the road, of course, minus friction but uh, the work done by friction. But the, so the idea here is, is that to even understand why something is conceptualized the way that it is, you need to understand the prior knowledge that made that conceptualization necessary as opposed to any other way of conceptualizing. Okay, so that's the motivation phase. The next phase is the question phase. What a question does in science is it frames an investigation in terms of prior knowledge and it sets a policy for how that new knowledge is to be found. Now, any policy like this is going to be founded on uh, prior knowledge. So any question presupposes certain earlier ideas. So the, the famous example of this is the ancient Greeks would troll each other by asking, uh, are you still beating your wife? And so the idea is, is that that question is loaded, as they say, it assumes you were beating your wife to begin with. So if you assume the question, if you answer the question, you're accepting certain premises. So in induction, we have to show explicitly how your earlier, pro your earlier context of knowledge earlier in the story gives rise to a particular question. In modern physics, um, Contemporary physicists have asked the question, how can we explain gravity as a quantum effect? This is what gives rise to string theory and quantum gravity. And as far as I know, this question is founded on an unproven assumption. I haven't researched this, but, there need, but I haven't seen anyone give a good answer as to why we should assume that gravity can be written in the language of quantum mechanics to begin with. That is, it's just simply, it's somehow just assumed and that, that assumption is not given argumentation yet a ton of research is based on this question. How can we formulate gravity in terms of quantum mechanics? So that's the question phase. We need to justify questions. So not only do we have to justify conclusions, we have to justify questions. Next is the investigation phase. And this is where you actually give the observations and reasoning steps, which allow you to answer the question. Now, in my view of induction, an investigation can consist of many different things. This can consist of observations, of course. It can consist of experiments. It can, exist of, it can consist of looking at records of 
observations that other people have taken. That's a lot of researchers never do their own observations. It's that's farmed out to someone else. They look at the records. And of course, they're trusting those people. But as long as those records are true, then the conclusions follow. It can also, another kind of investigation can be pure deduction from earlier premises. And I regard this as common in the field of mathematics. It can also involve, an investigation can also involve the formation of new concepts or simply the alteration of existing concepts based on further thinking. So I, I think Ayn Rand was particularly good at this last form of investigation, which is the alteration of existing concepts based on further thinking. She, her investigation phase consisted of an inter realizing, oh, wait, you know, we shouldn't conceptualize selfishness this way, or we shouldn't use this stupid word extremism, or many other examples of her repackaging our concepts. So, and, and of course, an investigation phase can also consist of some large combination of many of these things. So um, that's what an investigation entails. Um, and then finally, number four, the conclusion phase. This is where you state your findings in a single proposition, which can easily be reasoned from in future inductions. So you state your conclusion, that conclusion can now be referenced later in the story and reasoned from. And at all points, you're making sure that you're only reasoning from things which have been found to be true earlier in the story. Now, so that's the, so what these four phases do is it gives us a structure for recording our proofs, but it also actually gives you guidance as a scientist for how to conduct induction. It shows you how to move from your current context of knowledge into a new context of knowledge. Um, specifically, your prior context of knowledge and values motivate a certain question, which uh, will help you achieve your values, which, um, and, then, and then your earlier, oh wait, hold on. Um, it motivates a certain question, and that question, based on your earlier context of knowledge, will justify a particular set of investigative steps, which might allow you to answer it. So these four, this also, not only is this the form of a narrative, but this is also the form, this is also a guide you can use in doing your science. Uh, now, like I said, I've already used this method of narrative systematization to produce a rough proof of all of the principles of physics from ancient Greek astronomy all the way to the discovery of the nucleus. Now, uh, there's an enormous, so what this does is it overcomes the problem of con context of knowledge. You're able to actually check your entire context of knowledge and know that you're reasoning only from stuff which has been proven in the past and you're able to know that it isn't a floating abstraction. You actually understand the observations that gave rise to the abstraction. So there's an enormous cost though. There's an enormous cost to my method, which is that, which is that you have to start at the beginning. You have to actually resystematize your entire field. For physics, that's an enormous endeavor, which is why it's taken me seven years so far, and I only have a rough proof of part of the history of physics. Um, but if you do this in whatever field you're in, it will allow you to shrug off the faulty assumptions of the past and look, allow you to look at your field with completely clear eyes, knowing that you understand the essentials of your field for yourself, not as floating abstractions, but in terms of conclusions proven from observation. And if you do that, you will have an unprecedentedly powerful context of knowledge, which will enable uh, new discoveries. And that is the plan for the inductive physics project. So that's the inductive physics, that is the method of fictional narrative systematization, how it works and what you use it for. So I'll turn it over to your questions. All right, thanks a lot, James. That was good. Uh, Bob, you wanna jump in first here? Well, <clears throat> yes. Could you relate your ideas to some other things that people know already? 
uh, like uh, Bacon's theories about uh, scientific method adjusting things in order to make changes. Where does that fit in? So Bacon was in a very different context uh, than we are today. Um, in Bacon's day, my method of narrative systematization would basically be unnecessary. The reason is, is because at Bacon's time, very little was actually known. And especially very little was known that went beyond the perceptual level. So what Bacon did, what Bacon advocated for, uh, which is parallel to this method I just presented, is that he advocated for producing what he called natural histories. Uh, and a natural history is basically just an enormous compendium of facts. Just write down a lot of facts, says Bacon, and make sure that they're actually true facts. Um, uh, or, or maybe if you write something down that you're not sure of, you at least give some indication of your certainty level that that's actually a true phenomenon or not. And the reason for this is, as Bacon says, we have to reason from the instances. We, and, you know, Bacon was an inductivist. He, you know, he was very anti-rationalist, which was excellent uh, for Bacon. And he said, we have to reason from the instances. And to do that, we have to get clear on what the instances even are. In today's context of knowledge, we face a different challenge. We have basically applied um, we basically applied Bacon's methods. We live in Bacon's paradise. Bacon actually wrote a book uh, called Silvum Savarum, where there was an ancient, there's this society that's based on science, which is based on his scientific method, and they have just ungodly powers and everything. We live in that society today because of him, basically. Um, we used that method, but now we face it and we've come really far, but now we face a different challenge, which is that, which is that we, all, we have this, we were very clear on the perceptual facts. We built off of those, but now we've built, at least in math and physics, we've built so far off of those that we have lost sight of the ground. We don't know, I mean, not only we lost sight of the ground, but we've lost sight of all of the intermediary stories. We don't know, we, haven't, we don't have a systematic proof of all those intermediate stories. And so as a result, scientists are, are basically, they have a choice. They can either be skeptics or they can just basically be, uh, they can believe in science by consensus. Actually, I don't know if that's really the choice they face. I'd have to think about that more. But, it, but that, that they, a lot of times they feel as though this is the choice they face, is that they, they feel like they have to go by consensus. So Bacon, so I would say that Bacon had a parallel solution to a different problem that was inherent to his time, that they weren't even clear. They didn't even, they weren't even sold on the idea that you should focus on observations. And they weren't even clear on which observations were real and which were just fairy stories. How about Mill's methods? Mill's methods are a particular, now I actually don't like calling them Mill's methods because Bacon basically had them. So in my well, book, I might what I was thinking them. of when I asked about Bacon. Yeah, yeah, because Bacon has his method of tables and his method of tables is a more flexible and superior version of what we now call Mill's methods. Um, except Bacon never talks about the method of residues but I mean, yeah, the method of residues is, it's minor as far as I can tell. So it, it, the main three methods are difference, agreement, and concomitant variation. And Bacon uses these, he says, okay, like this is how Bacon uses them. He says, list all the instances um, where other phenomena are linked to the phenomena you're investigating. So for example, list, um, all the instances where um, motion is present at the same time heat is present. List all the instances where a certain chemical is present in all instances where heat is present. And so on all these things, it could like, because the chemical is present in all cases where heat is present, maybe the chemical is the cause of the heat. 
maybe, you know, uh, maybe motion is the cause of the heat because that's present a lot of times when heat is present. Um, and there are two other methods that are like this um, and Bacon goes through these. Um, my theory of induction does talk about these methods and it, it puts these methods into a wider framework of observational, uh, of inferential methods. Um, but that's not the job of narrative systematization. The job of narrative systematization is to make sure we're reasoning from prior knowledge that has actually been proven. It doesn't tell us how to reason from the knowledge. It just shows us, it just is a method to make sure we're only reasoning from prior knowledge, which has been proven. So Mill's methods, Bacon's methods are really details in your investigations. Yes, exactly. Okay. Where do you put your ideas with respect to Harriman and Peikoff's logical leap? That's a good question. This aspect of my method of induction is formalizing what is implicit in the logical leap. This is, I regard this as a major part of the solution to the problem of induction, probably the hard part. And the logical leap basically nails this. I disagree with about 50% of what's in the logical leap, but this is basically the 50% I do agree with, which is that you know, each stage of a sign of, of our knowledge is built on earlier stages and the logical leap, I really recommend reading it because what it does is it gives a bunch of examples that show exactly what this means. And by me reading the logical leap many times, what I've done here is I've formalized how to follow the standards which are implicit in the logical leap, that you can own, that you must reason from prior knowledge and observation. It turns out it's pretty hard to do that. You need standards, you need to follow standards. So that's, that's where my work kind of picks up where the logical leap left off. Uh, and now out of curiosity, I heard Keith Lockett today talk about ARU's course on the uh, Science, uh, do you know anything about that? Um, I actually talked to Keith uh, about that briefly and he said that he would be going in a historical narrative or I don't, he didn't say historical narrative. He'd be going in a historical order and I believe he said, what did he say? How did he word it? He said, he, uh, no, he didn't say this. The description of the course, which I read carefully, indicated that it would be one step leading to another. It, it said something like, the student will be able to track how scientists went from early astronomy all the way to an under, or like just watching the planets and stars all the way to uh, a theory of gravitation and why the planets move the way they do. And that sounds like an inductive process. I would really emphasize, though, that this can be done much more efficiently in terms of essentials if you do a fictional narrative. As crazy as that sounds just on the face of it, like, and, and this is why I own it. I say fiction. It's a fiction. You write a fictional story and you say, as long as these observations are possible, if you go outside and look at the stars, or mix these chemicals together, whatever it is, as long as these is what you actually observe, the conclusion follows. And if you fictionalize the account, it allows you to focus on the kinds of steps that are actually required to conduct a scientific investigation instead of getting tied up in all the non-essentials and accidents of history. So um, that's what I would, um, would comment there. So out of curiosity, is he familiar with what you're doing? Um, oh yeah, yeah, he's familiar. Okay. There's a super chat from Jamie Hernandez. So we'd like to thank Jamie. It's 25 units of MX. And I think that's a Mexican pe peso. So thank you, Jamie Hernandez. 
And thanks for supporting the Ayn Rand Center UK. And thank you, Daniel, our producer. So back to you guys. Was there a question, uh, Steve? No, there. No, just just an appreciation. No okay, thanks. Uh, I think that's enough for me right now. I've got general questions, but they, they may even be reserved for the uh, for the clubhouse. clubhouse. Okay, I have, a, I have a few things we might bring up, uh, James, just to points of discussion. Um, so you talk about uh, you need a reason from prior knowledge as well as observation. Of course, there is a, it's important to recognize, which I know you do, that you start, you know, for your first level stuff does not start from prior knowledge. It starts from observation yeah. first, and then after that, it's observation plus prior knowledge, or maybe just prior knowledge in some cases. But I'm just throwing yeah. that in, and, so, and uh, I think that's important. Realize that that's the story. Are you saying that observation is not knowledge? It's not prior knowledge. Uh, his, his term was prior knowledge. You, know, okay. you, you bring stuff that you, had, you already knew beforehand. But if you had to do that all the time, you'd have to have innate knowledge, which I doubt James uh, holds to. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, so no, yeah no, so my, no, no innate knowledge. Yeah, so I, I should correct myself is that it's not that it's not that all induction uses prior knowledge at the first level. You're just you're just observing and you see that. But right. basically, That's the right. hard part of induction, the parts that are actually controversial, which need proving which need actual thought and consideration to make sure that they're true that's the part that requires prior knowledge you know okay. although you know that's actually not true because like we were just talking like like bob just brought up with bacon bacon had to tell people look people we have to like be, all we got are the instances we need to get clear on what actually happens with these instances um we need, to, we need to be clear on what the difference is between fact and fiction. So for example, like does ball lightning exist? We know it lightning exists, like, like everyone's seen it, but there's this phenomenon called ball lightning. Is that real? And to this, by the way, to this day, we're still not sure. There's some evidence for it, but um, we actually aren't sure. Like it's, it's not, it's not, uh, it's it's not uh, there. There's not enough. There's not enough evidence that allows everyone to know for sure that that instance is true. So, you know, uh, you know, now that I think about it, uh, you know, that is an actual thing that needs inductive standards. But those inductive standards have been very well um, applied in the modern day, and the and the instances where we fail to collect good instances or to properly weight the instances are uh, a lot of times caused by bias um you know for example like okay we found one black man who got shot by the police we found another black man who got shot by the police okay is this a problem and of course everyone you know a lot of people agree that it is and of course that's caused by bias without actually looking at the instances and seeing if they're representative of some kind of problem mm -hmm. okay so um uh, I try to, when possible, to reduce the number of terms that apply to the same phenomenon, phenomenon because it gets confusing. So in yeah. objectivism, there is a term already existing called reduction, which seems yes. to be approximately or exactly or somewhere in the ballpark or something the same as inductive proof. Uh, now, the, it's interesting that the, uh, Bob says no, though. Okay, it's interesting that uh, although a reduction is talked about and there's some discussion, it is hardly ever actually done. There's, yes. There are very few examples because it's extremely hard to do. Yeah, You were saying that the same thing about inductive proof generally, that it's, it's very hard because you have to go back through. And if you really have to go back through the full context, that's a lot of work. And I think yes. the way that's going to play out, whether you call it reduction or inductive proof, whichever thing you call it, it's going to involve a lot of work. And I think that the way it's going to play out is that not everybody can do that work for all the concepts. There should be, there should be some serious division of labor involved. And then you report your results back rather than everybody has to go and reduce the whole of human knowledge or even the, re, re, even the whole of their knowledge. Everybody has to yeah. reduce that because that ain't going to, that ain't going to happen. So I gather you've got people, you've got slaves, I mean, uh, co colleagues, 
uh, working on this stuff. Graduates to reduce to reduce now even reducing physics is a, well I should say why I say even reducing physics is an enormous task. Anyway, uh, why don't you want to call this reduction? Uh, let's put it. Let's put that question first. I'm really glad you brought this up. Some of this bore some of this borders on stuff I'm not yet certain of, but it's the cutting edge. So what the hell? So um, right. Yeah. So, um, but here's the, here's the part I would little. say, yeah. I mean, here's, here's the place where I'm not sticking my neck out. I regard reduction as formulated in the objectivist corpus. I regard reduction as basically my process in reverse. In my process, we start with the evidence that can simply be gathered from the first level. You know, I looked up at the sky. I saw the sun. I saw the moon. On different nights, the moon has these different shapes. You know, I can see that the sun lights things up and then you reason from there and you keep going forward. That's an induction. A reduction is where you start with something more advanced, say like quantum mechanics, say that like the whole, th let's actually, let's, let's do something easier. Let's say um, uh, F equals MA, Newton's law, uh, second law of motion, you know, force causes acceleration, F equals MA. How do I know that's true, you ask? What, and so what you'd say is, is like, okay, well, in order to understand this, we have to understand what mass is. Okay, and so what's, what's mass? And that, you, and, that's, that, um, and that would have a whole genealogy behind it, a whole genealogy of earlier observations and reasoning steps, which allowed you to reach that concept. And it's actually kind of complicated because mass isn't the same thing as weight. And at first, people wouldn't know the difference. They would, they would just have a concept of weight. They wouldn't have a concept of strictly the amount of material something is made out of, mass. Um, you would need the concept of inertia, which is really what mass is. Mass is a thing that resists, or inertia is the thing that resists acceleration. You need to have the concept of acceleration, the idea of something changing in its state of motion as opposed to movement. So you'd need to give the observations which actually allowed you to differentiate motion, which is velocity, versus a change in motion, which is acceleration. Okay, and, that, and how did you make that distinction? Well, in order to make that distinction, you would have had to probably understand friction, which is the way Galileo ended up making this distinction, is he had to think about certain instances of friction. Um, and then you'd have to, so you, as, as you're saying, Lee, you'd have to go through this enormous genealogy, this enormous family tree. And um, it spider webs off in every direction. So I don't recommend it. For, for science, I do not recommend reduction. It is an, it's an unwieldy process. Um, so I, I think my process is better, but, but only if science is entirely reformulated in terms of my method. That's really what's required. You can't do my method halfway. Um, and it looks like we lost Bob, but I'm sure he'll be back soon. He'll, he'll, um, he'll get back, sure. Yeah, so, you, so um, now I'll make one other comment. Here's where I'm sticking my neck out. I think, like it, I think it's worth noting that reduction is rarely used. And I think it might be, I think we may not be clear on what we're doing as objectivists when we do reduction, because, you know, one, ex one example, I'll give one example of how reduction can be used, say, in a philosophic argument. This is the classic example. Um, a communist says that property is theft. And you say, okay, well, let's reduce the concept of uh, theft. What does theft mean? Well, it's, it's when you take someone's property away. Well, so you, you know, communist, you're contradicting yourself because if we try to connect your concept of theft back to reality, we notice that in order to even have the concept of theft, we need a concept of property. So this is just, it's just a blatant contradiction to say that property is theft. But here's the thing. I think what you're really doing when you do a debate tactic like that, you're not going backwards in the inductive order. You're going up the conditional hierarchy to bring up the topic we talked about last time. You're identifying a concept whose identity conditions the nature of theft. 
Now, what's interesting is the communist might have a completely different conditional hierarchy, a completely different way of structuring his knowledge. And he might say, property is when someone has a monopoly over the use of some particular resource. And, and, and theft is unjust, uh, uh, I'm just gonna redefine theft as unjust uh, usage of particular resources. So by my, in, in my structure of knowledge, property is theft. By your structure of knowledge, property isn't theft, but you just have a different structure of knowledge. You've, you've induced from reality differently than me and you've organized your conditional hierarchy differently. Um, so, I think so I think reduction might be uh, a, a faulty concept, might be. I have to emphasize this because I'm just not sure. That, yet. But that example doesn't really convince me, James, because first of all, that's not re really an example of a full reduction. It is, that is the classic example in the literature of a uh, stolen concept. That's what it's yeah. an example of. Now, you can say, yes, you could say that somebody could have a different, you, you framed it as a different hierarchy. But in fact, I think the objectivist view would be, I'm, I'm you know, sticking my neck out here a little, little bit, but not too far. I think the, the view would be that it is a faulty hierarchy that if you try to reduce it, it, it will not reduce to reality. It's yes. not just, so you can't just say, uh, uh, throw out, I mean, I'm not saying you framed it this way, but you can't just say that, well, I've got my way of doing it. You've got your way of doing it. And, you know, that's subjectivism, basically. The, the point, it would be that if you actually did conduct a reduction, you would find out that uh, the, their hierarchy is not reducible. And I think that's yeah. true. So, so yes, I'm not, it is that true. Example, so I'm, example, I'm bringing up. Work. Yeah. So I'm bringing up this example, not to say that it's a faulty debating tactic. It does refute the communist. Because if the communist then says, oh, well, I have a different concept of what property means and what theft means. Then you could reduce the concepts that they are um, making reference to there and eventually you'll get them. So like, for example, they use the word resource. And what the hell does that mean? Because eventually you'll be able to bring up that this is the ultimate, that the mind is the ultimate resource. And they're just, and they're just missing that fact. They just don't yeah. believe in that. So as a result, you'll be able to show that their structure is inductively flawed. It doesn't follow from observation. So yeah. the debate tactic does work to show that there's something wrong with what they're doing, but it doesn't show that they have inductively, well, hold on, but what that's doing, you're not asking them to do induction in reverse. You're asking them to go up their conditional hierarchy. And once you do that, you can see that their broader concepts are floating abstractions. Well, I'm, it doesn't I'm not gonna, show that they're, yeah. Without getting into this conditional hierarchy, well, let, we, maybe we can get into that again, because I don't accept that. But just as an, uh, 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 the logical hierarchy, what, what, what you can show is in the correct logical hierarchy, the concept of theft depends on, log is logically dependent on, I wouldn't say conditioned by, I would say is logically dependent on the concept of, uh, of property. And therefore, when you deny the concept of property, you have no right to use the concept of theft. That's the you know, stolen concept argument. But in yeah. order to, I actually would say as a debating tactic, it often doesn't work for precisely the reason you would just describe, which is to make it work, you really have to do a, a, something like a full reduction. And that's not gonna happen in, in a debate. You know? So it, it, as a debating tactic, it, it doesn't always work as a matter of fact. Anyway, we can talk about, uh, I got a few other things, unless you want to cap that we, off with something. We, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, let's go on. There's a lot raised yeah. there, but I'm sure the other stuff will be cooler. So Yeah, I'm going to do a few other things before we get to, we can come back in Clubhouse. And yeah. I, I do want to go back to that condition thing, which I think can be replaced by, by uh, simpler and clearer verb, uh, words, but we'll discuss that later. You mentioned entanglement. Now, hmm. I'm a... Uh, not a professional in physics like yourself. I'm a sort of semi, you know, I studied some physics in college. I read, read a lot, but I don't have a systematic knowledge and I don't have 
really enough mathematics and so but I, I know something and you know I read about that in particular and uh, there are people who who uh, uh, do accept entanglement uh, you know such as the advocates of the De Broglie Bohm version and they accept it as simply an experimental result that's just the findings of that is the findings of research you don't even have to I mean although it does seemingly contradict relativity, although there are arguments about that. I don't know how, how those arguments work out, but there's some arguments about whether it's a real contradiction or not. But whether it does or not, the people who accept it, accept it as simply an experimental finding, whereas the uh, opponents um, tr try to, you know, the Copenhagen types uh, try to, I, I, I can't even get my mind around what they're doing. They don't, they don't accept that it's really, you know, there's a reality out there that the experiment yeah. is describing. They don't accept that. So, so they're just philosophically wrong. And yeah. that's way, that is even, even us outside the theory of induction, they're just crazy as far as I can tell outside. And whereas the other guys, their, their induction is not, their inductive reasoning is not bad here. I think the, the, the people who advocate, for example, the De Broglie Bohm, you know, accept it as an experimental finding and then go from there. And I don't, I don't think they're making, so, the people that make the mistakes, a lot of them are, it's not, an, it's not a problem with their theory of induction. It's a problem with their theory of, of uh, uh, epistemology and metaphysics more generally. You know, the, the Copenhagen interpretation is, is, uh, has a lot of problems with it. So I just, yeah. I just throw so that I'll, out to you. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say briefly in response to that, that my, yeah. uh, the professors on my committee were largely people who were skeptical of the Copenhagen interpretation, or maybe even you'd say basically rejected it. But what they, the, the, so, and, and as you said, they accepted entanglement, but they weren't willing to accept that it constituted a faster than light causal interaction because that would involve contradicting Einstein. They accept, but, I mean, but that's and the, the Copenhagen people also accept, they accept, everyone accepts entanglement. Everyone accepts it as a phenomena. It's the, it's the underlying, it's, it's the identification of the phenomena as a fast and light causal interaction, which is uh, at contention. And you're right. The, um, I, I don't know how they, I don't, I don't, because I don't know your committee members, but I don't know how yeah. they can do that because, because that's the finding of the research is that there is a causal interaction that is, uh, that, that occurs, uh, you know, uh, faster than light, at least. You know, some of you think that's, it's instantaneous. Yeah, so that's, that's believe it or not, I, I would say yeah. that you are making an inference when you come to that conclusion. There are particular okay. uh -huh. assumptions in the field of what I call broad physical categories, which maybe we'll discuss uh -huh. in a later thing. You're, in, okay. you are reasoning implicitly from broad physical categories. And what makes the Copenhagen people crazy is that they don't believe in 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 these categories to put it glibly and then what made my th thesis committee wrong is that they simply weren't thinking for themselves so that's how i would frame that issue all right and then uh, similarly referring to quantum gravity which is again something i don't really know anything about but i've you know read a few Neither things do I. Uh, <laughs> uh, you say they assume that gravity can be described by, by qm I think people take that as a possibility. A lot of people take it as a possibility. They don't assume it. In fact, what they usually say is the more common thing that people say is that the two theories are inconsistent, and therefore one of them is wrong, and the one that's wrong is probably uh, GR. Is that that's the way people usually frame? It. So they frame it a little differently than uh, than uh, assuming that quantum gravity is described. Uh, assuming that, yeah, that, that I uh, see. So that I don't know if I, ag I don't, yeah. So I don't know if I agree with that argument, but that is at least a motivational argument for why we should investigate quantum gravity. So I would, yeah. I would stand corrected on that uh, right. concrete point there, because that again, I don't know if I think, I don't know if that's a valid argument or not, but that is, that is a motivational either. argument. Yeah, it's a mo it, okay. it it motivates it. If we assume it's right, it does yeah. motivate the investigation. Yeah. All right, I wanted to say what we're getting close here, but I wanted to say one thing about my my favorite scientists, 
uh, or one of my two favorite scientists anyway, Galileo, mm. because he brought something to the table that, that Bacon didn't. Mm. And uh, that, is, that is mathematics. Yeah. Galileo really, uh, of course, Galileo was a much, much, much better scientist, practicing scientist than Bacon. Bacon basically sucks in his practical science. Galileo is a, is a you know, super class, uh, you know, the, the fa he to me is the founder of modern science, uh, even though he, but he didn't use, the, I don't think he used the word induction. I don't remember ever seeing it, but he did, he did describe the method and he showed how experiment and mathematics integrate into inductive reasoning in a very, uh, you know, com uh, um, com think of the right word but anyway it's very it's very uh, compelling very compelling way and i think that's something that you'll want to take into account maybe you have already i don't remember but is exactly the the tremendously powerful role of mathematics particularly in the physical sciences although i'd say in everything but particularly the, that that role in inductive reasoning needs to be accounted for let me put it that way yeah uh, uh, I uh, 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 go, quick okay, comment go on that I, a quick comment yeah. on that. This is always brought up. Peacock has a whole lecture on the role of mathematics in physics and in science more broadly. To me, mathematics is just another science. It's just another inductive science. Now, there are particular aspects of mathematics which are different from the other sciences. And I don't want to get into them, but long story short, the, the mathematics is a man-made construct. And as a result, deduction and concept formation are mm, play a larger role than observation in mathematics. And that's not even that clear of a way to say it, but it's, it's, that's vaguely it. Um, but other than that, it's all based on observation. Mathematics is yeah, just another one of the sciences and it, and I, because gonna, it's identifying. I'm objective to just. Yeah. When objective to just, it yeah. has a significance for the other sciences Yes, that is as uh, unique, and I, and I think myself just to throw in a quick thing here, I think it's I think it comes down to or at least part of the explanation is that causality of all kinds is quantitative. Yes, whether it's uh, pushing a ball, whether it's uh, uh, the, the rates of chemical reactions, whether it's the amount of mental effort put into um, a thought, you know, all of that stuff. The more of, of one thing, the more of the the more of the cause, the more of the effect is a very uh, pervasive phenomenon. And I think that accounts for, well, has a lot to do with the uh, importance of math. It also, in my opinion, accounts for how, me why measurement omission works in concept formation, but that's a whole other story. And we probably shouldn't uh, uh, go further into that. But anyway, I think it's important to integrate the role of mathematics into the inductive Anyway, I recommend that sounds very it. fruitful. I have not done work Just on that, it. but that sounds very fruitful. Okay, so um, we're, um, we're super chat, a, uh, super chat from yeah. Bonnie B Bertrand for two bucks. Thank you, Bo Bonnie. She's there's no comment, <clears throat> she's just oh, one no, of no regulars. Question, huh? No, all question. right, well, thanks, Bonnie. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, about the motivation. Well, you know, we, I think we ought to discuss, we talked about this a little ahead of time, but I think, James, I think we ought to discuss this further in another session. What do you think? <laughs> I, I completely agree. <laughs> All right. Is that <laughs> because... Uh, I completely agree, Lee. Yeah. Here's, here's something you said that I, I, I have to say to my ear was a reductio ad absurdum, but maybe, hmm. you know, I could be wrong. You, you say you have to justify directing your eyeballs. If yeah. I had to justify directing my eyeballs every time I direct my eyeballs, I would not be able to get up in the morning from bed. I would not be able to do a thing. I'd be frozen. I think that's just crazy. That's my immediate response. Anyway. Yeah. So, so yeah, do you on really, its face, really believe yeah. that I have to justify my directing my eyeballs? I have to justify if I'm going to look over here to this thing happening or that. I have to justify it. You don't really think that. Well, Context. okay. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, give me the context. Go ahead, James. Oh, James. Is gonna um, I, I would be interested to hear how you would class it, how, we, how you would argue in my favor here, Bob. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, me too, Bob. That was a, a very narrow statement in the context of inductive reasoning, 
doing this in the logical order, when you get to the step of uh, you want to look at things, did you adjust your eyeballs? Yeah, so, so, so here's an example. At one point, Galileo directed his telescope. He literally swiveled his eyeballs towards the sky. He directed his telescope towards Venus so that he could observe its phases. Now, why did he do that? It's because if you look closely at, at the phases of Venus, the way parts of Venus are lit up and other parts aren't, you can get a crescent Venus and a half Venus, just like you can get a crescent moon, half moon. Um, when you look at these phases of Venus, you're actually able to disprove the geocentric theory of the solar system. You're able to show that the sun couldn't, uh, that the earth couldn't possibly be at the center. So Galileo literally directed his eyeballs at Venus for a particular reason, having to do with his prior context of knowledge, namely that he, had, he was trying to prove that it was the sun, not the uh -huh. earth at the center. And so okay. now, when, now that doesn't mean that when you uh, wake up in the morning or when you in, in, uh, conduct your investigation, you justify every single step you make before you make it. That is, of course, analysis paralysis, as they say. But what you do do is once the investigation is complete and you've reached your conclusion, you then formulate your investigations, your reasonings, your question, you formulate it according to my method, showing how your prior context of knowledge did justify your particular observations. All right, okay, but this is a, this is a very, I, I'm inclined to agree with this, but this is a very different claim from the claim that before you do something, you have to come up with a justification. So I think I'm in agreed, but I, I, I will have to explore this further. Uh, and I think we're going to do that uh, next next yeah. time. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds that's, good. That's, yeah. And we're, we're about, unless, Bob, you want to pop in here with something else? Uh, you look like it. No, no, I was looking okay. to see for Clubhouse. It's time to go to Clubhouse, right, Daniel? Uh, uh, Bob's already there. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks a lot, James. I was uh, uh, very good. Uh, and we are going to uh, see if anybody else would like to rake you over the, or question you, question you. Very good. About what you're, I look forward to uh, it. At, at Clubhouse. All right, we'll see everybody shortly. Very good. Thanks for having me.